Guys, I don't know if I have the energy to watch another episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! Vrains. Like, just after one of the worst duels ever, it just gets worse every time I think about it. And after another damn recap ep episode after going off for a week? Like, come on, what is wrong with this show? I just don't think I can take much more of this. Oh my god, you're telling me an episode with no bland one-dimensional Yusaku in it? It, it actually mostly follows characters with real personalities and story arcs and who I actually give a crap about. Oh my god, baby, I'm back in! <laughs> so yeah, if you couldn't tell by the intro, um, my faith was waning. And I won't say this episode has me completely back on track with where this is going, but, and I know this sounds crazy, god damn it, this was great. <laughs> um, and I know, some of you were thinking, this?! This? <laughs> I know, it's crazy, but follow with me, I'm going somewhere on this. This episode really wasn't about anything. There's some little stuff that might get developed, but we keep thinking that and it never happens, so I don't know. Um, but what I loved about this episode is something I never thought I would actually say in my life, but this episode was filler. Pure, unapologetic, unrelenting waste of time filler and god damn it it's what we needed um and i know that's a weird thing to say because on the opposite end of the shonen spectrum you have black C clover which has filler every five minutes but in a lot of ways filler when used correctly can be important and this is a prime example of this the filler was used to sort of reinvigorate everything. It was used to give us a break. It was used to sort of just have a little fun and to reinvigorate the characters and to sort of re-give you an idea of their personalities and why you want to like them. Like, we get this idea in our heads that filler is awful, and yeah, to an extent, a lot of filler, i.e. namely things like Bleach and One Piece, is bad, but there is also some filler that can be really helpful. This is going to sound crazy to a lot of people, but I actually didn't mind that huge filler arc that was at the end of the original Naruto in between it and Shippuden. I actually was kind of okay with it, because it did something I didn't think we were getting a lot of in the actual series, and that was just getting to know the world and getting to see the other shinobi. I remember when Naruto was airing, they always had this tagline for it, the Rookie Nine, the Rookie Nine together again, the Rookie Nine all in one place, all that, blah, 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 but during the main story, you don't see a lot of the Rookie Nine. And in manga, that's a bit more okay, because manga chapters are so much more condensed, but as far as the anime goes, you have that time to sort of play with things and introduce characters, and that filler arc actually does a lot to really sculpt everyone out. Like, even going back to Naruto Episode 2, when we actually get a little added scene, I don't believe it's in Chapter 1 of the manga, we actually get a little shot of Hinata showing off her little crush on Naruto, being like, do your best, and that was really interesting, because that was at it. That was something that didn't need to be there, but it sets up so much, and in that filler arc, they actually start setting up Naruto and Hinata's eventual relationship and love for each other just by having them go on little adventures and get to know each other and do fun stuff together. That was great, and that added to the story. Don't get me wrong, the filler gets old after a while, especially in Shippuden, but they used filler to add to the story, and that's what was done here. They used filler to make you care about the characters, and they did do creative stuff with it as well. Uh, first and foremost, you have that scene between Aoi and Akira where Aoi actually challenges Akira. It's not a huge challenge, but it's important considering how sort of subservient they make her to him a lot of times. I like that little scene where she's just like, he might be nearby and he probably is like Playmaker in real life. And Akira's like, no, nah, no, wait, he hides everything. That's a great little showing of their personalities and how they're different. 
Aoi has lived a double life for a while now, and you can argue always has, always having to be the little sister who just does as she's told, but also wanting more, and then expanding this to become Blue Angel, someone who is the very different from her personality, but as the story has progressed, we see that as the situation got more serious, more of her real-life personality went into who she is in Vrains, to the point where she actually changes who she is to make a new character that actually looks more like she does in real life. So therefore, she can connect to Playmaker on a deeper level than anyone else. She can understand that concept of needing to hide yourself, and how as much as you might try to, eventually who you are will bleed out. And that is what she's looking for. She's barely talked to him, but she has a deeper connection to her, to him than anyone else, because of just who she is and what they've established of her personality, not because the plot says so. Not because she's a target demographic who's just the same thing as Yusaku. She's her own thing, but she can connect to him. Then you have Akira, who is used to being direct. He's used to getting the answers. He's used to coming up with everything first. But because of this, the conclusion he comes to fits more in line with what he thinks. Playmaker must be hiding things. Playmaker must be much more complicated than I think he is, so he can't really see that. So we see Aoi's plan go into action, and in a weird way... She does get what she wants. She gets Naoki. And I like that Naoki was just talking shit. Like, she's just like, oh, I'm Playmaker's best friend. We're total buddies. Like, we're soulmates. That was great. Naoki feels like someone who would definitely t be like that. Just be like, tell everyone Playmaker's my best friend. And I like that they chase the lead down. I like that Aoi really came up with a plan and really thought of ideas. Yeah, the whole event was Emma's idea, but it was still Aoi driving the episode forward. I'd rather have that before I get another episode of Yusaku ever again. Um, so then we get the actual duel between Emma and Naoki, and this was perfect. First up, I actually really like the fact that Emma uses her sexuality and her attractiveness to actually, like, manipulate people. We haven't seen that in this franchise since Mai, and even though some people are like, in a world where you need to sort of make your female characters better, maybe you shouldn't basically make her one step above a hooker, but I actually think it's kind of a welcome change considering how stagnant they have been with just, like, the... I don't know the right way to put this, like the way the women work in this show. So I kind of like it. And also I like the fact that it's done in a way that feels logical. Naoki is a dumb 16 year old kid. Of course, of course, if a beautiful woman is just talking to him out of nowhere, he's going to go for it and just try. And then we get to that duel and oh God, I fucking love the duel. <laughs> I legitimately love the way that Naoki is just like so sure of himself and so much. This strategy is great. And I also like getting to see Altergeist. I actually really like what Altergeist does for the game in real life. Having this more sort of slower, grindy, like sort of control deck. Again, thanks to the new end of round procedures, it's kind of waning in popularity, but I do like the fact that the deck exists, and I like the fact that they didn't just give her a bunch of new Altergeist cards just to fill pack space. Like, no. She used the good ones. She used the annoying Out to Dark Law the deck has. Remember that, people. Altergeists have an Out to Dark Law built into them that they can get to easily. She does real Altergeist plays, and when it gets to Naoki's turn and he does his bullshit, they're sitting there like, there's no way he's this stupid. There's no way his deck is this dumb. There's no way he's this bad, and he is that bad. It wasn't even like that dumb a play. Like, I could see that strategy, and the weird thing is, you see the stuff Yusaku does half the time. It's not that much dumber than what Naoki did, but they actually called it on its bullshit. Like, this is a dumb and a bad play. Of course she's going to have trap cards. I don't know why no one else in this show ever has trap cards for dealing with this stuff, but whatever. <laughs> Um, and then when it goes back to the extra deck, and he's just like, oh, well, it can't go back to my hands, therefore your effect doesn't work, and they're just staring like, no, no, there's no way he's this stupid, how could he not... <laughs> Oh, it was fantastic. It's like they took stories people have from Dueling Book and just put into an episode. I've had that happen to me. I face people and I activate, like, I don't know, Compulse on an extra deck monster. And like, oh, well, it can't go back to my hand. Card doesn't work. That That's totally how that works. 
or like they'll be like I use Solemn Strike on a Fusion Summon or like I use Thunder King on that or something like that. You guys get where I'm going with this. Like just that sort of really dumb. They didn't think anything through. They didn't look at any rulings. I felt like that's what we got. And it was just, oh, it was just so good. I know many of you are probably thinking this is what he considers fixing the series. This is what gets him psyched again. I know it seems crazy and it kind of is. I mean, look what we're talking about. But I legitimately loved this episode because it brought back what Yu-Gi-Oh! is supposed to actually be about. It's supposed to be a fun game, and it's supposed to be a universe where people just want to enjoy that game and just want to live their lives and connect with each other. The most important part about Yu-Gi-Oh! in real life is ultimately having fun and meeting new people. And the series throughout its 20 years, though I've commented a lot about how it doesn't really embody the real life spirit of Yu-Gi-Oh!, it does try to include it. It does try to be about friendship and bonds and make the world feel like it's worth saving. And I don't feel that with Yusaku. I don't feel like I should care about this world or dueling or that he cares about dueling. This episode made me care again. It was just about having fun and playing cards and just kind of giving us a break from a boring mundane plot and making you care about the characters again and using their personalities to actually move it forward. That's something we desperately need in this show right now and I would love this mentality to be brought to the rest of the show going forward. Will it? I don't know. Maybe this will just be the last bash of fun but if it is, I really liked this, and I want more of this. I want more of this out of Yu-Gi-Oh! But that's what I think. I know I went on a long time about this. Tell me what you think in the comments section below. Uh, as for the TCG question of the week, um, Cybernetic Horizon sneak peek this weekend. What you're looking for? Is it Boral Sword Dragon? It's, it's probably Boral Sword Dragon. I actually kind of want to pick up Paladonians. It's just like a fun deck. Uh, they aren't great. Honestly, there was a lot of stuff in this set that people at first thought was going to be amazing and format defining, but it didn't wind up happening. Um, but Or maybe you're looking for the danger stuff. But I still think there's a lot of fun stuff to try in this deck. A lot of cool legacy support for things other than original Yu-Gi-Oh! So I'm on board. I'm excited. Tell me what you think. And as always, click to like, click subscribe, and let's hope these good feelings continue.